Well, there's no doubt about the fact that we are living in exciting times. Technological advances, scientific discoveries, medical breakthroughs seem to be occurring almost daily in our lives. Uh, one wonders where all this is going to end. One wonders where all this is taking us. Those of you here this morning in the older generation, you have seen some incredible things in your lives. The pace of progress in your lifetime has been extraordinary. And perhaps for you, it's been one of those things that it's hard for you to keep up with what has been happening as you think back over your life. The ease of transportation, the, the, the speed now of communication. Today, there are machines, aren't there, that are, that are doing things in minutes that took days, even hours, days, as you think back to your youth, those of you who are older. Lives that were lost when some of you were younger are now lives that are often saved. Yesterday's dreams have become today's realities. And it seems that tomorrow's possibilities are endless. Our society is certainly very clever. But friends, despite what we might be tempted to think, our society is not the first to see great advances. Actually, as Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. Now, in this, our final study into the character of Cain today, we're considering what I'm simply calling Cain's culture. You see, even way back at the cradle of human society, there were amazing advancements back then. It was a clever culture. But their society just like our society, was also a society of sensuality and of violence. It was not only a clever culture, it was a corrupt culture. Cain's culture is alive and well today. And though many years have obviously passed, thousands of years have passed since Cain walked on this earth, his culture lives on. And yet the hope for the ills and the woes of Cain's culture were and are curable in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're considering this morning Cain's culture from the second half of Genesis chapter 4. And there are four, three things rather that I'd like for us to notice. We'll look at a clever culture. Secondly, we'll look at a corrupt culture. And then thirdly, a curable culture. Firstly then, a clever culture. Culture. Now, I'm using that term clever by referring to the advances, referring to the developments that Moses here mentioned as he writes by the inspiration of the Spirit of God after Cain had received his sentence from God, remember, for murdering Abel, his brother. Moses tells us in Genesis 4 and verse 16 that Cain moves away. He says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So Cain moves away from the place, it seems, that's associated with and connected to where the people are worshipping God. Moses tells us specifically at the end of verse 16 where he went. He went to dwell in the land of Nod. Nod, not meaning sleep. We might say we go to the land of Nod to have a sleep. He doesn't mean that. Nod literally means wandering. And most likely it got this name because Cain dwelt there. Cain, remember, is a fugitive. He's a, he's a, a wanderer. He's a vagabond. Cain, God said, would go from place to place in his life. And so it's in this very region, somewhere east of the barred garden of Eden, that Cain, we can't say settled, but Cain took up general residence in this broader region in his restless state. Moses then tells us that Cain was married, it seems he was married already, and he and Mrs. Cain, pardon the reference, began to have children. 
He says in verse 17, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Don't get confused. That's not the good Enoch in chapter 5. This is a different Enoch. So Cain and Mrs. Cain begin to have children. Now, of course, the question is raised, and we just touch on it in passing. Who did Cain marry? Where did Cain get this woman from? Most often, skeptics love to raise this question, thinking that they've got a question that Christians can't answer, that they've found a thing in the Bible right at the start where the Bible can't be true. Well, as Christians, we don't need to be intimidated from that. It's, it's an obvious thing if you really do believe God speaks through the Bible that this is a trustworthy book. He obviously married either his sister or maybe his niece. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4, it tells us that Adam had many sons and daughters. And back in those times, marrying your own sister was not harmful as it is today. Back then, there were few, if any, genetic defects. Hence, it was only later that God outlawed such marriages as is recorded in Leviticus chapter 18. But not so in these early days. How else would they be fruitful and multiply and obey God's command? Nevertheless, we leave that there. I, I needed to say something, didn't I? It is with numeric growth that Moses then shows us that Cain's family begins to develop in terms of a culture. And that's our focus. We need to see here from this passage, I believe, what comes out to us, a clever culture. And there are several things that are just right there on the surface of the text. <laughs> Firstly, in verse 17, it develops socially. The end of verse 17, it says, And he, Cain, built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. This is the first mention in the Bible of urbanization. God had said, remember, that Cain would wander about. But now what is Cain doing? He's building a city. He's seeming like wanting to have one location. So maybe this is Cain in defiance of God's word. It's just out of rebellion that he builds the, the first recorded city in human history. We certainly do know that the foundation of Cain's culture is one of rebellion. Remember? He was rebellious standing before the judge when sentence was pronounced upon him, as we saw last week. Cain had a heart of rebellion. And that, that rebellious spirit was the undercurrent, if we could call that, of the culture that rose from him and his descendants. And that rebellion is very evident right down to our very day today. Rebellion displayed in our culture. Rebellion displayed, for instance, in the general attitude that our culture has towards authority. God-given authority, parental authority, civil authority, authority even in the context of the church. Rebellion evident in our culture's music. Rebellion evident in our culture's dress and its physical appearance and so on today. Rebellion is surely the undercurrent of our culture. It is the undercurrent of Cain's culture. Perhaps there's another reason why Cain built this city. Perhaps it was that he built it out of fear. Remember what he was. He was a fugitive. Cain was so very insecure and restless, he felt threatened for his very existence. Did he want protection then behind city walls? So rather than trusting in God to keep his word that we saw last week. He goes off to design his own protection because Cain ultimately wanted to be the master of his own destiny. And how much is that the attitude of Cain's culture? How much is that promoted today to be the master of your own destiny? When Cain was restless and insecure, he doesn't go to God for a place of rest and safety. He was not trusting in God's promise. But rather he went off to rely upon his own resources. 
And obviously he was rather resourceful with what he was achieving. But rather than looking to the Lord, he looks to construct a city to build a human fortress to hide behind. You see, deep within Cain's heart, pulsating through Cain's culture, even as it developed socially, was this spirit of self-sufficiency. I can do it. I just got to set my mind to it and I can do it. And friends, that was and that is the essence of Cain's culture. It's not a reliance on God. It's a self-reliance. A cultural mindset that trusts in man's own resources and ingenuity. Looking to oneself for the answers. So, for instance, when there might be a long and extended period of drought, what does Cain's culture do? The growing city needs water. Rather than cry out to God to provide the rain, it goes off in all of its cleverness, spending its millions and putting into place all these ingenious means of saving and gaining water cultural mindset that relies on man's resources and ingenuity rather than looking to the Lord of the heavens. Nothing new under the sun is there. Nothing new at all. And here is Cain. Within his own self he is deeply restless. But in his need of restlessness he doesn't go to God. I think Augustine's famous words are very relevant here where he said, speaking to God, he says, You have formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. No city, no network of friends, be that social networking on the internet, or be that your pals, no network of friends, no city, no, no local community can take the place of a relationship with God. True rest is found only in Jesus Christ. And yet, nevertheless, we see here, Cain's culture was developing socially. But we see other things. As we move forward in the passage. It develops agriculturally. In verses 18 and 19, we have the reference to Cain's family. And then we're told in verse 20, in Adab or Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and livestock. Jabal. This is the man that developed the art of keeping and managing cattle. Actually, the word cattle here, as it's translated in the New King James, refers to more than just cows. It also refers to camels and possibly donkeys and goats. It's referring to various herds if you like, various livestock. Jabel, we also see in verse 20 something else. He's the inventor of tents. He, he developed the whole concept of movable accommodation. He's the father, if we like, of the modern uh, relocatable homes. He's the father of the modern caravan or camper van. Clever culture. And yet when we analyze this, he's, we see in terms of his activity that he, he's working out how to maximize his profits by moving his herds around to greener pastures and traveling with his stock. This is the commencement of the nomadic lifestyle, maybe we would say. And the bottom line for this advancement agriculturally was surely greater profit. It would seem he had something of a diverse business here he wasn't just going down one track to make his income he had as we say today diversified you think it through when you think about what is happening here he looked for ways to to produce more beasts why because if he could sell those beasts they would be beasts of burden they were the ancient truck they were the ancient trailer the ancient ute to carry things about there's one line of 
business activity, but he could also be developing the, the whole milk industry, better pastures, better dairy products. And then, of course, we think of what's on the back of all those beasts. They've got skins. Here's his booming clothing line. Women haven't changed. I'm sure they loved clothes back then just as much as they do today. So Jabel perhaps saw a potential market with the fleece and the hide on the back of his stock. Remember, he's also the inventor of tents. He had beasts producing skins that could be tanned and could be treated. And that, of course, would go into the growing tent market. Cain's culture was and is a clever culture. It is enterprising. We see here it develops agriculturally. We move forward in verse 21. We see it develops musically. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. So while Jabel's out looking after his livestock and tanning the hide and doing his milking and doing all that he's got to do, Jubal, his brother, is busy inventing musical instruments. So Jubal is the father of the modern orchestra. He invented both, if you look carefully, invented both the string and the wind instruments. That's, from my point of view, at least, it's the essence of a real good orchestra. I mean, anyone can bang a drum. Percussion's there, but anyway, we won't go there. Jubal is the mastermind behind the whole entertainment industry. And in particular, music was his thing. But he was obviously clever with his hands because he's the father of all those who play the harp and flute. He's obviously got some connection, if not a craftsman himself, to produce such sweet and melodious sounds. He knows when it's off and he knows when it's not off. So not only does he have good hands, God's given him a good ear. From this reference in verse 21, we get the impression, don't we, that this was a cultured society. We think back here and think, oh, it's primitive, <laughs> cave stuff. No, this is a cultured society with the development of the arts and music. But now notice in verse 22, as we come to this other aspect, it develops industrially. He goes on to say, as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So Tubal Cain obviously studied the physical and chemical behavior of metallic elements. He, he, he discovered the, the benefit of making, making things from metal. He acquired keen engineering skills. So there's almost something in this passage for everyone here today. The iron plow and the metal garden fork was soon discovered to be far more effective than the old wooden one. What a market opened up for Tubal Cain. Every woman wanted his metal cooking pots and utensils. How did they get by without them before? Construction sites waited for the next metal pick. And what help for weaponry this must have been, these inventions. Life was made so much easier. His farming tools took much of the toil out of the farming task compared to what it was before. What a great discovery this man found. This is no doubt that this had an unprecedented impact on the standard of living for that generation. It was a revolutionary change for the better. It was a clever culture. What are we seeing in these verses? A clever society where there was real cultural development 
And yet I wonder as we read that before and as we've looked at some of those verses, have you noticed that there has been not one mention of God? It actually stands out in stark contrast when you read as a block the first four chapters. God is mentioned everywhere from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 through to chapter 4 and verse 16 and then suddenly the lights go out. Suddenly there's nothing. You see the clever culture was godless. That is, they had sought to remove God from their thinking, from their lives. The famous composer Johann Sebastian Bach often wrote the initials on many of the things that he was composing. The initials simply being S-D-G, standing for Solo Deo Gloria. To God's glory alone. In Cain's culture, there was no thought of God. There was no prayer to God. There was no dependence upon God. There was no glory to God. This was a self-sufficient culture that relied on its own inventions and advancements. God was not on their radar. Seems to me that Cain's culture is alive and well today. In all our medical advancements and scientific discoveries and technological developments today, do we hear God being acknowledged? No. As then, so now. There is a deathly silence of God's existence. We don't need God. I mean, look how clever we are. Look what we've been able to do. In recent years, we've sent a craft to Mars. Yes, our parents, they saw them go to the moon, but now we're getting to Mars. Multitudes of electronic gadgets, they're just falling out of our pockets. Our rapid medical advancements are startling. It's nothing to do with God. It's all about celebrating man's achievements. Friends, how was it that Jabel, Jubal and Tubal Cain could make discoveries? God stood behind it. He was the one that put all those things there in the first place. Man just discovered them. That's all. And somehow he becomes the hero. And to enable those discoveries, God gave them their brains. God gave them their hands. God gave them their ears. God was quietly at work in his providence, opening the way for man. That is God's common grace. It is his common grace that showers talents and insights on all men. That he gives his good gifts both on the righteous and the unrighteous, as the Bible says that God is good, to all. James says every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. God allowed them. And God allows today an unbelieving culture to discover new things in multitudes of fields, to develop new technologies for the benefit of this present life. We should take a step back from this and not applaud man, but say, wow, how good is God considering that culture? And yet what God in his common grace allows and gives to men And we need to think that such discoveries surely only render that society even more inexcusable because all of these things are God's gifts. And they have been given for his glory, not man's. It's stealing to take the credit. 
This passage here in Genesis 4 is helpful, I believe, on another level for us as Christians today. Because the reality is, though some of the great scientific discoveries have been made by Christians, so that's wonderful. But friends, many, many, many advances in our culture have occurred through non-Christian, even atheistic thinking people. And yet as we trace these here in Genesis 4, these discoveries, as we trace them through in the Bible, we see that God's people readily use them. In a few chapters after this one, we find Abraham, the father of the faithful. Where is he living? He's living in tents. What's he doing for an income? He's caring for his herds. Skilled craftsmen in metal and wood were employed in the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. Certainly we know that the harp was later used in temple worship. And David was a harpist. You see the point? Therefore the culture, the industrial, the technological advances, they do not belong to the world. God stands behind such social progress. The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. Christians can and Christians ought to utilize such advances for God's glory. They ought to utilize such advances for the edification of the body of Christ. They ought to utilize such advances and such progress and such technology for the gospel to be proclaimed. Well, Cain's culture might have been clever, but it's far from clean. Let's look secondly at the second thing we see here, a corrupt culture. And I believe as we look at verses 23 and 24, some other verses that we see, it's sensuality. Firstly, in verse 19, we go back there, it says, Then Lamech took for himself, himself two wives. That should hit us. Here we have the first radical departure from God's established order of the family in creation. You go back, please, with me to chapter 2 of Genesis. Let's see it again. Chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one Flesh, One man, one woman, joined together to become one. Jesus reiterates this in Matthew. Says, As it was established from the beginning, Jesus says, the two become one. And yet here in Genesis 4 verse 19, what are we seeing in Cain's culture? Cain's culture seeks to redefine marriage. That is always a mark of Cain's rebellious culture. The culture mindset that says, just one man and one woman for life? I mean, why just male and female? And why even bother marrying at all? God's ways are just too restrictive. It's time to cast off these these old-fashioned restrictions from a past generation. We've come of age. Cain's culture back then was blazon about overturning God's established order. And Cain's culture today is certainly aggressive in seeking to redefine marriage today. Solomon's right. There's nothing new under the sun. There's something else here, though, if you look in the second half of verse 19. The names that Lamech, his wives, the names of one was Adar. The name of the second was Zillah. Adar means pleasure, beautiful ornament. Zillah means shade. That challenges the commentators more. (laughs) Some say that they think this speaks of the beautiful head of hair, the, the covering of beautiful hair that this woman Zilla had. 
When you look at verse 22, we find another of the lady's names, Lamech's granddaughter. Is it Neymar? That name means lovely for beauty. Here's a culture fostered by Lamech that's enamored with beauty, physical pleasure, outer beauty, outer charm. And we see that all of this comes to its height in Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 2 where we read that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. Their choice of a wife was based upon what they saw. Rather than living by Peter's perspective, when Peter says it should be the hidden person, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, or Proverbs 31, that charm is actually deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. We know, don't we, that our culture is one which disregards the sanctity of marriage more and more, whilst at the same time is a culture obsessed with sensuality and outward beauty. Worshipping the cult of sexuality and beauty. It's a corrupt culture and we look at its sensuality, but now over to verse 23, it's savagery. What's Lemek say to his wives? He says, Adar Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Here this seems to be the first song recorded in the Bible. And you notice the theme of this song? Notice the theme of these words? It's a song of violence. It's a song of self-assertion. It's a song of pride. Cain might have succumbed to murderous hatred. But here Lamech exalts in it. Lamech seems to be celebrating what he has done. He boasts about his violence in killing a young man who had but bruised him or maybe merely wounded him. It's clearly a defiant spirit here. Anyone who gets in my way, anyone who dares to hurt me, I will kill. We get a little insight into the heart of this man reflection of this cultural mindset here in this aspect. He's proud about his courage. He's proud about his strength to strike down anyone who dares cross him. Cain's culture is one that shows little restraint and therefore is also marked by savagery or violence, we would more commonly say. As then, so now. Nothing has changed, has it, friends? We live in Cain's culture. Now, where is the hope for such a culture? As one here today, if you would be a policeman seeking to control these things, you'd want hope. <laughs> we want hope, don't we? Where's the hope for such a culture like that? Is it all black? It looks like God has gone from the earth when you read the end of chapter 4. It looks like, and we look out on our society, if we can become so negative in our outlook, it would seem, oh, God's gone in our society. <gasps> what hope is there? There's hope. Thirdly and finally, it is a curable culture. I want us to just step back for half a minute. Do you remember what Moses is actually doing in these chapters. He's doing more than just giving us historical data or data, whichever one you want. He's given us more than just a history lesson. lesson. He's teaching us something. These things have been written for our instruction. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God so that we might be instructed ultimately in righteousness. What's Moses doing in these chapters? He's showing us two seeds. 
He's showing us two lines of humanity. Look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. What's she say? For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Here we get another glimpse, I think, of the faith of Eve. Don't get a lot, but we get a few glimpses in these first few chapters. Why does she say seed? Because she believes something. Go back to chapter 3. She's remembering God's promise. Verse 15 of chapter 3 where God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God's saying there's going to be two lines, there's going to be two seeds. And in chapter 4 we have the line of the ungodly through Cain and now at the end of chapter 4 and in through to chapter 5 we have the godly line. And the point that we need to see is that these two lines run together in the same society, that they are existing at the same time. We could get the impression by reading verse 25 that this happened after Lamech, but I don't think we need to think that. And I say that because when we look at the generation. That the, the, the Lamech of Cain's culture in chapter 4 was the seventh generation from Adam. Whilst if we track, track down the godly line in chapter 5, you know where Enoch was. He's the seventh from Adam. Jude confirms that, that to us in his little book. And also we must remember the length of time in which these generations live. And there was tremendous overlap with who was alive at the same time in the earth back then. The point being, all was not dark in Cain's culture, as is the case today. God has his people who act as salt in a corrupt and decaying society. God has his people then, God has his people ever since, God has his people today acting as light in a dark society. But honing in this, this reference here to Seth and his seed, it has something even far more thrilling to say. Because I would suggest it speaks of, or it hints of, a cure. The hope for that culture back then, or ours today, lies in who would come in this godly line. Now, friends, we must not miss this. Because there is gospel light here. Only once is Seth mentioned in the New Testament. And it's in the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 3. And I want to ask that you would turn with me there, please. You can preach the Gospel from the Old Testament. I hope you are convinced of that by now. You can preach the Gospel from Genesis. The Gospel's here. As we let the other passages of the Word of God shed light back upon it, in in Luke chapter 3, Seth is mentioned in verse 38. It says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Now, notice, Abel, not mentioned. Seth's mentioned. It's a family tree. Okay, it's family tree work backwards. So if we would trace this list backwards, where's all this headed? Verse 23 of Luke 3. Now Jesus himself, Jesus himself, began to minister at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Methat, and on and on and on it goes until we get down to verse 38. Friends, the, the answer for every problem in Cain's culture back then or today lies in the good news concerning Jesus Christ, in the one promise to come in Genesis 3.15, who did come and who did crush Satan's head. So these early sinners 
must live by faith. They must believe in the Christ to come, not trusting in themselves, but trusting in him who was promised to come, the promised deliverer, the Christ. Christ was the cure for them to be delivered from the corrupt culture around them. Faith in Jesus Christ transformed their lives. It transformed their families, I believe. Faith in Jesus Christ was the hope for that generation. We go back then to the passage, to the last verse in Genesis 4. We see where this comes out. Verse 26, As for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. At the very time when technology was advancing at unprecedented pace, and moral restraint was being thrown off, marriage was being redefined, and sensuality and violence increasing on the earth. At that very time, God's Spirit began to move in the hearts of some men, making them interested, making them willing to call on the name of the Lord, giving to them faith to believe in Jesus to come. This phrase right there at the end of chapter 4, it's like a beacon of light in this passage. It's a wonderful way to finish. These are those who call on the name of the Lord. That phrase is used repeatedly after this in the Bible in many different places. To call on the name of the Lord can be a general reference to prayer. But Moses also uses it in reference to deliberate acts of worship. Over in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8, it says that Abram built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. What did he do on that altar? Just sit up there and pray? I would suggest he sacrificed. That's what the altar was for. He sacrificed. He worshipped his God. He called on the name of the Lord, Moses says. The same thing said about Isaac in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 25. So not only worshipping God, though, privately and in their families, but I want to suggest to you, but here we see also as a public aspect to it, that they're gathering in assembly. In Psalm 116, we find the phrase again. And in Psalm 116, we read, I will take up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Where? Where? What context that psalm tells us? In the presence of all his people. Most commentators that I have referred to take this reference in Genesis 4.26 to refer to corporate or public worship. And Paul uses this same phrase as he commences his letter to the church in Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all, with all, who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Corinth, they were publicly known in their culture as being God's people. They called on the name of the Lord. And here, friends, in the days of Seth, he and others, men it says, not just him by himself, him and others began to call on God's name, not just privately and secretly or in the context of family, but it appears from this phrase as usage in the Scriptures that it also happened openly, it also happened in a measure publicly. They unashamedly declared their faith in Jehovah in the midst of their culture. That was a bold move, wasn't it? We've seen that culture. They boldly gathered together for worship. When the world's society around them was degenerate and decaying, what was God doing? God was raising up those who called out to Him in faith. They looked to Him to provide the deliverer that they knew that they desperately needed because God had opened their eyes to see their need. 
And they knew that their hope for the souls, the hope for their family, the hope for their society was in that deliverer. He was in Christ. And Christ alone. These people began to distinguish themselves from the ungodly world. Some read the phrase, man began to call on the name of the Lord to be, man began to be known by the name or to be called by the name of the Lord. We get some evidence of that if we understand chapter 6 and verse 2 that reference the sons of God to be real people, which I believe it is. There's this distinction between the sons of God and the sons of men, the godly line, that's the context, and the ungodly line. You see, they began to distinguish themselves from the ungodly world. They didn't try and look as much as possible like the world to try and win the world. That wasn't their approach. They distinguish themselves by being called the sons of God, by being known by the name of the Lord as they called on the name of the Lord. There was a clear distinction between the godly and the ungodly. This passage, as we think of Seth and this whole thing that's happening here, this passage seems to suggest that this spark of grace began in the heart of Seth that's where Moses seems to underscore it began in Seth's heart but it didn't stop there it spread to others I wonder has the spark of God's grace been ignited in your heart it was in Seth's day that man began to call on the name of the Lord. The spark of God's grace started with one who stood for God in his generation. Will you stand for God? Stand for him in terms of the context of even your own family. Stand for God in the context of your workplace, with your, with your classmates, in your neighbourhood with your friends? Would it be that God would use you to ignite a flame in others? It is the grace of God that we need. The cure came to Seth and his family when they looked away from themselves and they looked to Christ alone and they began to call on his name they began to uh, seek him earnestly and then it spread to others you see this is what is needed today surely the spark of God's grace setting a blaze in your heart making you unashamed to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ unashamed to be a worshipper of Jesus unashamedly associated with the Lord's people unashamedly known to be part of God's church or oh, that the spark of God's grace would then ignite in the hearts of others around you in your own family in your neighbourhood we might see the blaze of grace spreading God raising up other worshippers of his name among your own friends throughout our community here bringing hope to a clever but corrupt culture these three characters when it comes to advancements that we've looked at this morning Jabel, Jubal and Tubal Cain all sought to make a name for themselves but Seth didn't he looked to Christ it was to Christ and to Christ alone he was setting about making a name but the name of Christ was the name that he was on about he set his mind on things above not on things of the earth. It's quite an impressive resume when you read these other chaps and you get to Seth and you think, oh, that's all your resume says. That's not, that's not the issue. He's a man of faith. His heart is set on things above, not on things of the earth. Whatever it was, legitimate things he pursued, they in the end are not important in light of the other issue. 
Cain's men, well, they might have found worldly success, wealth, fame, but that is not what is ultimately important. What matters is whether men worship God and enjoy Him forever. That's what counts. The world measures a man by what he does. It measures a man by what toys he accumulates, by what, by what talents he has, by what achievements he may make in his career. But that is not the mark of the godly. Only one mark counts, friend. Are you calling on the name of the Lord? Are you resting in Christ alone? Are you living for Him? Are you standing for Him in where you are planted by God? Are you sacrificing for Him? What is it that you know you need to offer up on the altar today? Is it your studies? Is it that prized, precious job you want? Is it your business? Is it your sport? In heaven, it won't matter if you have built a city and it was named after you. It won't matter if you become the mayor and the Prime Minister of that community. It won't matter if you have invented some new gadget and become a world-class violinist or harpist. It won't matter if you've been extremely successful in your business or on your farm or you scored that job or you got that big promotion. In the end, it won't matter where you worked. What will matter is whether you were a true worshipper of Jesus Christ. What will matter is whether you have loved Jesus Christ with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and therefore that means you have lived a life seeking first His kingdom. Possessions, degrees, positions, reputations, names, they will never satisfy your soul and in the end, friends, they don't matter. In the big picture. I know there's lots of other things I could say, but in the end, in heaven, they don't matter. The only cure for this culture, the only cure for your family, the only cure for your life is in Christ alone. Trusting alone in Him and living for Him and His glory. Living a life of worship, a life of devotion and dedication to Him. A life of sacrifice on the altar for Him who is worthy. May none here go in the words of Jude. May none here go in the way of Cain. Get sucked into the cesspool of Cain's culture that seems so right and so appealing, especially when you're young. May God place the spark of grace within each of our hearts. And may that spark be ignited by His Spirit in the hearts of many others in our day. That more and more around us would look to Christ alone and to live for Christ alone. So that in our day, in this clever, and corrupt culture, we may see, verse 26, happen right at the end, that men in a new and a fresh way begin to call on the name of Christ. May it please our sovereign God to work that in our hearts and in our generation. Let's pray.